Welcome back and thank you for joining us on the second part as we uh, continue our conversation with Ndeleka Mandela on this day, the 11th of February, where we are commemorating and remembering the historic day of the release of her late granddad, that is the icon, yes. Nelson Madiba yes. Mandela. So um, back to you, Tunji. Yes. Ndeleka, basically your, your, your grandma, Epli Masse, as you said, just your life is the sum total well, your character is the sum total of what your grandmother, Evelyn Mass, says. Now, can you just give our viewers a sense? I mean, your grandmother, Evelyn, had four children for Nelson Mandela. Out of six children, she had four. Now, how, in those long years of incarceration, almost three days, how was grandma able to cope? How was she living her life? I mean, you give us a sense her being the first business woman and all of that in those days, how was she coping with the loss in terms of that companionship that her husband would have given her, you know, to raise her four children? Well, you know, it, uh, you know, Hundu, I, I called Evelyn Hundu, which has a pet name. Hundu mm-hmm. was, 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 you know, a, I think she learned because she was orphaned at a very young age. And she learned to, to survive. She learned survival skills. You know, she was taken in by her older brother, who was the one that actually took her to, uh, you know, encouraged her to come to Johannesburg and train as a nurse. So from a young age, she was self-sufficient. So, you know, and even in the marriage, she was, because my grandfather studied. So she was the one that was paying the bills at home because my grandfather was not earning an income. So in, in, in the sense of security, she didn't lose much. Yes, she lost, she lost a companion. And one of the things I think the best advice that her brother gave her when she, she, she went to, to, to him to say, look, uh, Nelson wants a divorce. And she just said to her, well, all I can say to you, my sister, that when a man no longer loves you, you just need to pick up your stuff and leave. And she, she had that sense of dignity to, to say, okay, the marriage is over. My man is in love with another woman. Let me, let me leave. Then she left and she started divorce proceedings. And, um, you know, yes, she, I'm sure she must have missed granddad, but growing up, I never witnessed that. Uh, perhaps I never looked at, his, at it with, with, those, with, that, with that perception. But what is actually telling is that when Granddad got released, perhaps, you know, a Hundu nest certain uh, romantic thoughts that they would reconcile. And when, when my grandfather married a, a, a Mam Grasa, shortly after that, my grandmother remarried as well. Mm. So for me, it, 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 it's planting a seed that you know, when she, when granddad separated from Mama Winnie, perhaps Kondo Ness thought that perhaps he would then come back to her, and he didn't. So that, that did not, uh, uh, was not something that was glaring in my child's eye for me. I just, I knew that she doted on me, but she was a very strong woman. You must remember, my grandmother was a nurse. She never did any accounting or bookkeeping. But when she, she was the kind of woman that immersed herself in anything that she did, because when she started running that shop, she even taught me double book entry, something that I, she, she was self-taught. 
in that she 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 knew how to price things that were new. You know, there was a formula that she used when she went to buy goods. You know, you take the selling price, you add a little percentage, then you add general sales tax, which is what we call VAT in our days, and then you have that. And she also taught me how to balance the book, how to float, how to take out the money of the general sales tax out of the takings for the day and you bank that separately so that you can pay the receiver. So these are the things that she taught me without even going to school for them. And, and that's why I say she was a, you know, an extraordinary woman. Mm. A very strict and uh, a no-nonsense woman. I mean, she taught me the value of hard work. I mean, you know, we had the head housekeeper at home. Yes, sometimes we'd have maybe to clean in, in the house, but I knew my chores wake up, go to school, come back at two o'clock, have lunch, go back to uh, afternoon study, four o'clock afternoon study, uh, three to four is afternoon study. I come back, the shop closed at five. I come back, I go back to the shop. I help with pressing the stuff and packing for the next day. My friends knew that they can, they could never visit me because my grandmother talk, felt that we meet at school. What else are we going to talk about except wow. gossip? Hated <laughs> gossip. So I was, I knew my work, and when I come back on days that there was no afternoon studies, I would go start the stove, a coal stove, and start cooking. I I mean to this day I still love cooking. I find it relaxing because of of how she brought me up. Mm. She brought me up that you roll up your sleeve, you do the, your things your own. If you want to do anything right, you must do it. Wow. Um, phenomenal yeah. women um, the, like, uh, who uh, raised you. And it's such an honor and a privilege to hear that side of the story of these giants, you know, who nurtured you and brought you up to the woman that you are. Uh, and um, for obvious reasons, for most of us, you know, we only associate you with the name Mandela that you carry. And in previous interviews, you have spoken and um, highlighted the tension and the frustration of having to live in the shadows of the name. Um, just tell us a little bit about that experience for you. How has it been, you know, going through life and trying to establish yourself as an, as an, as an individual and uh, your own identity? Well, ironically enough, that came when my grandfather became a, a, a president because prior to that, nobody cared. Mm. What it is that it did, it did because I was a I was a progeny of a terrorist for all they care. <laughs> Even where I grew up, nobody really cared about my last name, you know. Um, but it's quite frustrating because I just I don't think any one of us can step out of that shadow. Mm. Yes, I, I I I have now carved my own niche of being outspoken. Mm -hmm. And, and most of the time I get this frustration of saying, but what would your grandfather say, you know? And, and I'm not his clone, you know, God gave us free will. And she, he also did not bring me up. So like I said that, you know, Yasha, the sum total of who I am is my grandmother. And my grandmother taught me to revere only one person and that's God. I'm not scared of other human beings because she, that's how she brought me up. I really don't care where you come from. The person that I revere is only God. So when I voice out my misgivings about the ANC, about the political scenario, people tend to think that, oh, what would your grandfather say? For instance, when I was writing my book and I, we had finished editing it and uh, you know, cutting and proofreading, and then came the last proofread where I had to just see if everything that I wanted to say was encompassed in the book. I then took it back. I said, no, I'm fine. It can now go to print. The editor, who's a white woman, did not want, said, well, came up with the, with the, with the, a, a, a response that my book, I sound too angry because maybe in her white cap as a woman, you know, it's not Mandelask to, to sound that angry. Then I said to her, I do not care. This is not a thesis. This is my story. If I, if I sound angry, that is because I am angry. And I want it to come up in a book. I don't want to sugarcoat things. This is my life. I'm not writing a research paper or a thesis. 
So I, I even threatened them, like, if you do not print it as it is, I'm going to look for another publisher. Because there are places where she felt that, you know, perhaps I, I could have toned down my, I can, I could have, you know, watered down my tone. But I was not going to do that up because it's, it's my story. So there, there are certain instances where people would think that, oh, how dare she says that? What would the grandfather say? You know, we're not the descendants of Jesus Christ. Mm. We, 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 and and great granddad even said himself that he's, he's, he's flawed. We are all fundamentally flawed. He's, he said that he's not a saint. So I'm allowed to make my own mistakes and to be benchmarked against such an icon. I feel that is a bit unfair. Mm. Actually, not even a bit unfair. It is unfair because granddad was not there to mold us the way he would want, even if he was there to mold us. We are own, we're our own people. We have our own aspiration and ambitions oh. and no one and no one has a right to actually say, you are not like your grandfather and to, to be constantly benchmarking us against him. So nowadays I live my life the way I want to live, you know, mm-hmm. because I've always been that person that is an unconformist. So yeah. if you have your opinions about who I'm supposed to be, well, tough luck on you. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not, I'm not living my life. I have my own covenant with God. Mm-hmm. He has carved his way of how, of the path and the journey that he wants me to travel, similar to what Grandad's journey was. Our all, all our journeys are different. Mm-hmm. We're all the individuals on this earth fulfilling our life's purpose, and this is my life's purpose. And nobody will prescribe to me how I do it, as long as I'm right with God. Mm. And I feel good in my heart and in my soul. That is all that matters. Mm. Sorry, okay. if I could just do a quick follow-up question on that. So, Ndilaka, so what does it mean to be a Mandela? I mean, um, some would, would look at you and say, um, with this magnificent name that can get you into, you know, supposedly any parts of the world, you know, turn the heads of any person, um, they would think that surely there is something in the name that, um, is, 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 to, is to maybe not re- to revere, but um, for you personally, what, what, what is it? What's in the name for you? I would advise you to, write, to read my book. Mm-hmm. The title says, I am Dilega, more than my name. I am Dilega first before I'm a Mandela. That's how I describe myself. I, okay. I, I refuse to be boxed into a last name. Mm. I am I am I am a mother. I am a, a social justice activist. I am a grandmother before I'm a Mandela. Mm. So for me, the name it could be well be like uh, you know Mutelezi uh, or Lamino or whatever. What's in the name? However, there are perks to I, I would I won't sit here and lie in front and sit in front of you and lie to say that being a Mandela doesn't have its pets. It does have its pets. Mm. It does also, it's a double-edged sword mm. because to some people you are this privileged spoiled brat that can get anything that you want. Mm. On the other side of the spectrum is 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 a name that can open doors. However, those doors will open to you in as long as what you say and how you you behave or how you carry yourself is interpreted by a certain audience. Mm. People, my grandmother also used to say this, you know, you may be a Mandela, but inadvertently and in the final analysis, it's how you carry yourself mm. and what do you do for humanity that will differentiate you from the rest of the meal. And that's how I live my life. Yes, certainly, it, 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 it does open doors, not to say it opened doors for, for people to say, here's a check, here's an open mm-hmm. checkbook, how much mm-hmm. do you want? It opened doors for me to be able to voice out, yes, some of the people, they humor me, they will open those doors, but that doesn't mean opening that door comes with a blank checkbook. Mm-hmm. I still, only granddad could manage to do that. By on the pick, he pick up a phone, by the end of that conversation, he has risen about, a million rands. Why? Because he had paid his dues as a human as a human being. I still have to pay my dues 
as a human being to able to have that kind of power. However, when I travel, you know, for instance, I went to Tunisia in 2017. As a civilian, I was invited to go to a festival, a cultural festival that was in the middle of a desert. But I was able to see the head of state, the president of that country, by virtue of the fact that I'm a Mandela. So it does have those perks that I'm, I am in audiences and, and in, 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 a, in a company of people I would not ordinarily be in a company of by virtue of what granted did not want to. Yes, nowadays it's because I get invited because of the work that I do as a social activist. But previously it used to be purely on granted's name. However, I'm quite happy that, that I have started to have my own niche, my own voice. And that's why my book was important to me because it has, I had to make my voice heard by people that this is who I am and I make no apologies for who I am. Okay. Now, Indeleka, look, you've spoken about your grandmother in very powerful terms. I mean, I like the part where she taught you about bookkeeping. I did a little bit of bookkeeping. And I know it's not a picnic to do bookkeeping mm -hmm. because you have to be very alert and focused. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you've also spoken about your dad and the cowboy, uh, full compliment that you got. Mm -hmm. And also that you, you know, the other experience was at his funeral, which happened when you were very tender. Well, can you give us, just talk to us about your mother, your mother, because in all of this, we've heard about your grandmother, your dad, and your grandfather, your great grandfather, your, the great man. Tell us about your mother. Who was she? And are you, were you very close? Well, my mom uh, was a, a, was a mshanga coming from Nelspreet. She was in Gebele. We did not have a very good relation with mom because I was a very stubborn child one when I became a teenager, but also the fact that my grandmother was more like a mother to me because from the age of two, she brought me up. I would see my mother, my mother was more like an aunt to me because I would see mom mainly on holidays. And because of the fact that she also remarried and also I, we also butted head with my, my stepfather because of the way I was brought up. A case in point is when I was 16, I was at Daluang at the time, boarding school, and my then boyfriend had written me a letter and posted it. I had given him the address of Durban because that's where I was going to be for holidays. Mm -hmm. So when I got home from playing, my stepfather hands me this letter, having opened it. I point blank told him, you've opened it, you must respond to it because it, it clearly it's, it's your letter. That's how cheeky I, that's how cheeky I was. <laughs> so be, because of that cheekiness and 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 you know of, of how I was brought up, because even with Granddad, I was very cheeky. You know, when when I wrote to Granddad after seeing him the first time in Robin Island, I wrote to him and told him, Look, you know, I have a stepfather who, who shouts at me. And I, I laughed, I laughed nowadays when I read that letter because I mean I thought to myself. The 16-year-old of the ninth of the 1980s, some of those, I mean, those children were quite obedient, but I was not, that did not even come to my head. As I was telling him, look, this man is 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 treating me like a, he shouts at me as if she he's a giant. I'm not gonna respect him. And actually, I blame you, Granddad, because you encouraged my mother to remarry after my father died. Actually, it's your fault that I have this man as my father now. So that's the, that, that, that just gives a glimpse of who I was even back then. So I chickily said to him, look, you go and respond to that letter because it, clearly it's your letter because you've opened and read it. And this is not how I was brought up. Because of my grandmother, strict as she was, she would never open my mail. So because of that, I, we, we really butted head with, with mom, you know, and, and when I fell pregnant, age 19, I remember my mother asked me to come to Devon and I told her I'm not going to come to Devon, I'm going to live with my grandmother. And I will never forget it, my stepfather called, my grandmother was in Queenstown doing grocery for the shop, and he told me that if I don't come back, to the home in, in, in Durban. I must never set foot in that house again. And I told him point blank that I would never come. And, I, and true, true, to, true to form, I never went back to Durban until 
who were burying my, grand, my, my, my stepfather. And I felt my mother had taken sides. Instead of actually nurturing me as his child, he di she didn't. And when, and, and when I went to Cape Town prior, I had known my stepfather as a distant uncle. And when Nandi, my sister, told me that she has a new father, and I told him, look, you don't have a father. Your father died, you know, in a car accident. And my, Nandi said, no, Phineas is our father. I said, no, I have, we have a father. Our father died. And when I went to Cape Town, my mother showed me albums of them getting married. I was furious mm. that here I was, I, I was 10 years old. I felt my mother owed me an explanation why she was remarrying. And she did that without telling me. And because of those things, we really butted head with, with, with mom, you know. And it's something that after he she committed suicide, it, those are the things that I do regret of, of we could have mended ways because the they, me that's now, right now, because after she died, I then went for therapy. You know, I was in, after, actually, I went for therapy after my uncle died. It is during the therapy sessions that my anger about my mother came about. And it was through therapy that I was able to reconcile with the person that my mother was and the choices that she made as a parent. And I thank her today. I thank her for having the foresight to make sure that I grew up with my grandmother because I don't think I would have turned out to be the Ndileva that I am today had my mother and father not made that decision that I was to be raised by, by Evelyn. Wow. Okay. The story is incredible. Very powerful. Yeah. I, see, I see lots of books coming up. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now that I've, I've, I mean, I, I need to sit and write my, my follow-up book, you know, to to I am Dileka. There's there's a lot of stories to tell. Mm, absolutely, and and uh, are you a good storyteller too? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, just uh, moving you a little more recent times, Dileka. Um, you have made headlines uh, with a little bit of controversy. That's uh, you sound like you've had to uh, fight and push through all your life. Um, and the headlines is that you have come out and have said that you will not vote for ANC again. Um, can you just tell us about um, why the shift? And, uh, you know, you've explained to us that you felt this pressure to conform to certain political views. Um, okay. And you're boldly coming out to show your own political um, mind. Where are you with the decision about voting or not voting for ANC? I'm definitely not voting for the ANC again. I'll, I'll vote for the UDM. I'd rather give my vote to the mm. You know, um, in 2017, at the height of, you know, Zuma must fall. It, actually, it was before Zuma must fall. I woke up. It, it was slow coming, you know. It was a lot of things. And it was life as a demeaning. Mm. I think it was life as a demeaning that actually pushed me over the edge. I woke up one day in the morning, 2017, because early in the year, and I switched on my TV in my room, and there were headlines running that a number of people had died with life is demeaning. Mm -hmm. And as I remember going to ask my daughter, was there a fire? It, because I'm a nurse by profession. I know a mentally ill patient is not physically ill. Mm -hmm. So how could people in a mental institution die? And it was upon me unpacking what was happening in life as a man that I thought to myself, you know what, this is not even according to the, to the principles, even the founding document of the, of the Freedom Charter, which is the, the, the constitution of the ANC, and it also made it to the constitution of our country, that the people shall govern, the people shall have decent homes, and they shall have land, they shall have you know, optimum health. And that just did not speak to that. And at the height of that, there was the, now the state capture. So I pronounced that here that as in as long as Zuma is president, I will not vote for the ANC. And then there was a change of guard, 2018, early 2018. And I thought, well, there's a new Tumemina, you know, there's, you know, perhaps a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe some people will see some people in orange jumpsuit in prison somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
No, it was not to be. And now we are smack in the middle of COVID. 500 billion has been borrowed from the IMF to purchase PPE. What does that money do? It ends up lining the pockets of politicians and corrupt people, corrupt business people of double billing and over inflating prices of PPE. That results in a lot of people dying. Not only that, frontline workers in the Eastern Cape as I speak right now, do not have PPE. Mm. Schools in the Eastern Cape are actually forced to buy their own PPE. When PPE money was supplied and actually borrowed, this is a loan, a loan that my granddaughter will have to pay long after I'm dead. No, I will not vote for such an organization that actually does not care. It spits in the face of voters. There's, there, there, there is no consequence management within the ANC whatsoever. All we hear is that Ace Mahashule was charged. There's no consequence. I have yet to see a person behind bars because of corruption. I don't understand how is it that our government cannot see the consequences and the repercussions of corruption. Because it does, it, just, it don't just rob children it, it actually is it's it's raping our souls it is making our children it, it robs our children of proper education of proper of, of of proper schooling of proper health and 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 there are people scavenging in bins in the eastern cape because there are no jobs we have double digit unemployment especially among the youth no, I will not vote for such a government. I, I, I will not in, in all conscience because if I continue to vote for the ANC, I'm actually being complicit and I'm becoming an accomplice for them to continue stealing and pillaging from the poor to line their pockets. Wow. It's a serious state of affairs. Now, um, just to uh, round off, I have this, uh, I know that grandpa, you know, great Nelson Mandela was a man who gave many quotes on education and so many, he was a philosopher king, if you like. Mm. Now, mm. can you do this for us? Can you give us a quote that granddad, one of his quotes that you find most compelling that you like to share with us and also to sign off with us? So, we can leave this interview feeling inspired. Well, it is mainly on education, honestly. It's education is, is what does it say that, no, actually, it is his, the quote on his long walk to freedom that I have walked that long walk to freedom. I have faltered along the way. I have many made mistakes. I have made many missteps along the way. But now I am currently resting to take a look at the glorious vista that surrounds me. But the walk is not finished. That is the one because my walk towards social injustice has not finished. Mm. You know, my book and my story thus far. Is, is, is me taking a, a vista of the road I've traveled so far, mm. but there's still a long road ahead. For as long as the people sleep without food, mm. there's so much to do. And so as long as there's a person that do not have proper care, as long as there's a child in the Eastern Cape that is studying under a tree, my lock, my work hasn't finished similar to Granted. Powerful. Wow. You are a true Mandela and you are in the leg, <laughs> and you are the granddaughter of every Masi and the Thank daughter you. of Tembe Kili Mandela. You, you. you are the first of the first of the yeah. I thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for that um, very vulnerable, authentic conversation you've had with us, just sharing uh, your truths with us and um, a lot of information about your family. 
we value that there's so much that we can learn as Africa from your life story, the road you have traveled and your passion for social justice, which came through so strongly. And um, also just to highlight that there's more detail that is available in Deleka's book. Uh, mm-hmm. For those who are watching, please go and get it, read it, be inspired by her life. Um, and it is titled, I am Deleka more than my surname. Uh, I presume it's available uh, in bookstores yes, online, it's available on Amazon. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. Even online, it's available online. Even well. online as well. So let's support her. And um, we, we, we are tuned into your story and into your journey in Deleka to see the impact that your own very life is uh, making and leaving this place a better place. So we thank you for all that work you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and from me, And finally, for me, Yasha Grace, I will say to you, to Notenda, Sarai Moshe. Until next time, goodbye. Yeah.